All right. Is this on? Can you guys hear me all right? All right. To, to, is, you can hear me too all right. Should I stop yelling? Uh, <laughs> okay. Uh, well, it's good to see you all here. Thank you for returning for another exciting round of church history. Till it's still a little hot. It looks like Kurt maybe bring me down. I'm a lot more excited than Brian. My hands go. I'm all hopped up on caffeine. So um, anyway, it's good to see you guys here tonight. Um, let me pray for us. And we got a lot to cover, about a thousand years of world and church history. So that should be easy. And uh, anyway, I might be speaking fast. But uh, let's pray and ask the Lord to bless our time as we get into it. Uh, Lord, we thank you for this evening. I thank you for uh, my brothers and sisters in Christ, who we get to uh, see each other so often and uh, learn together and worship together and share food together and all these ways that you bless us in each other's company. And we ask that tonight as we gather together again to try to learn uh, just the story of how your church has uh, developed over the years and all the ups and downs and ins and outs of it. Um, that we would be stirred, that we would be encouraged in you, that we would um, be better students of our faith and also the word of God, and uh, that you would um, bless us uh, in this time. I ask that you give me clarity of thought and speech and that uh, things are clear and that your purposes would be manifest or would come to in this time. We pray this all in the name of Jesus. Amen. All righty, so we are in the third session of uh, our church history course here, the Church Through the Ages, and like I said, we're covering about a thousand years of history in this course, uh, what are popularly known as the Middle Ages. Uh, some people refer to it as the Dark Ages. I think that's not a good title for this, and I hope that you see a lot of light and goodness and wonder that comes through in this period of church history. As we start, I want to just have some opening comments. I think I chose this period of church history to teach um, because it's the one that I knew the least about, uh, least about. And I think probably most of us would probably say something similar. Um, it's easy as Protestants who uh, in, inherit the tradition coming out of the Protestant Reformation to kind of just look at the early church as our history, the church councils as our history, and then they just be like, and then it was like Catholic Church for a while. It's kind of a mess. And then our church history starts again uh, when Luther nails some paper to a door, right? Um, and that's, I think that's the wrong way to look at it. Uh, we need to understand this period of church history as our history. Uh, the Protestant Reformation uh, came because of a lot of developments that were happening in this time. A lot of things that got flushed out by a lot of people that went before the Protestants and kind of paved the ground for a lot of their thoughts and a lot of their critiques and a lot of their emphases. And uh, also, I think it's just it's one of the easiest things to do in the world is to look back on church or to look back on history in general and pass easy judgments from our modern frame of reference. Uh, but I do think it's we should try to get ourselves into the mindset as best as we can uh, to this period of uh, world history, which was a chaotic time in world history. And Christianity was just caught up in it, the Christian faith and flushing that out and and the operations of the church were kind of caught up in this uh, pretty tumultuous time of world history and world events. And um, that means we're going to see a lot of things that don't represent the name of Christ well. And we're going to see a lot of corruption. And we're going to see uh, some people who just uh, didn't do well. But we're also going to see a lot of wonderful believers and a lot of people who are real examples of the faith and people who uh, were um, maybe doing the best in the system that they had available to them in a lot of ways. And uh, what I want us to do is just see this as this is our history. Uh, this is uh, our history is the good and the bad. You don't get to cut people out of your family history just because uh, they were kind of, a, you know, a rough mark. They're part of your history and they shaped uh, how you or they shaped who you were eventually down the line uh, through God's providence. So um, as we jump in, I just want us to have that in mind. The first thing I want to do is jump into the introduction here. I have two main bullet points here. The church as east and west and the establishment of the papacy. I put that in scare quotes because I'm trying to see it as an entity. Uh, it's not just a, a church father uh, as all the fathers uh, or bishops of the church were. They are known as fathers. But it is the papacy. And how did it become the papacy? 
Um, I'm going to be brief in here, but I'm going to start in the 4th and 5th century. Uh, how did the church become east and west? This is really important uh, in what we're talking about. And uh, really, it's really because of this. Uh, remember the Christian empire uh, is kind of what takes hold uh, after Constantine. And uh, because of uh, it being merged into these imperial leadership dynamics, uh, some of the imperial leadership structures are going to flush out in the life of the church. Uh, it just kind of makes sense. It's the most efficient. And so as Brian gave us in this map that he showed us last week, uh, there were these major cities in the Mediterranean world that kind of led the church in this day and age, these six major cities. And it was Carthage, it was Alexandria, it was Jerusalem, it was Antioch, and it was Ephesus, and it was Rome. And the uh, bishops of these cities were kind of the big bishops of their area, and the other smaller churches in their area that were outside of the major cities were under their control. It was just kind of the way it, it worked out efficiently, and that's just how the imperial dynamics worked out and how leadership happened. Uh, the bishop in Rome obviously became the most prominent pretty easily because Rome was the capital city of the entire empire. And so the bishop of Rome becomes very important. It's usually one of the most educated uh, bishops and one of the most uh, well, well-known well bishops in the church that ends up getting that role. And so that becomes uh, the primary seat of leadership in the church. They at least carry a lot of weight. Um, in the 4th and 5th century. Something interesting happens. Constantine moves from Rome to Constantinople, uh, actually a city that was called Byzantium. And so uh, tonight I might refer to the Byzantine Empire. Uh, this is just the Eastern Empire that took root in Constantinople. Uh, that's uh, those, All those go together. East is Byzantine, it's Constantinople. Uh, he moves the capital to there, which means that the church there now becomes very prominent because it's the main church in the main city of the empire, right? And actually at the Council of Chalcedon, uh, Chalcedon um, the emperor there and the council there says, uh, listen, these two bishops, Rome and Constantinople, are the two primary bishops uh, or are the two heads of the, of the church. So essentially uh, these ideas begin to play out in this way. And we get these two major churches and these two major leaders and the people who hold that office carry a ton of weight in the church in the direction of the church. Um, that's very brief. The establishment of the papacy. What happens is when things get moved to Constantinople and people start to say, this is the new Rome, well, the bishops in old Rome are like, hey, wait a, heck, wait, wait a second here. You know, we're, we're really important. What do you mean it's a new Rome? Uh, and they kind of react against this, and they start to try to beef up their credibility uh, through a lot of claims. And the major claim is that the city or the church in Rome is Peter's church. Uh, and this was kind of church tradition. The church in Rome, uh, they say, was planted by Peter and by Paul. And they would say the uh, promises in Matthew 16 by Jesus that you are Peter uh, and on this rock I'll build my church. They're saying, listen, that uh, is to the Roman church or to especially the leader of the Roman church. And this is when these claims start to get developed in a little bit more. Uh, that's Pope Leo is one of the first ones to start to develop this idea of the Roman bish bishops being direct successors in line from Peter himself. And then, uh, and, and then he also kind of moves it from, instead of just the Roman church, but the, actually the papal chair in Rome is actually the true foundation of the church. It's a, uh, a move that happens around uh, 440 to 461. That's the dates of Pope Leo there. Uh, also, world events start to happen such that the uh, church leaders in these major cities, especially Rome, start to have to play a pretty political role. Um, they are always involved in politics ever since the empire became Christian. Uh, but the Rome collapses, and or Rome gets taken over in 420, or, or sorry, 410. And there aren't strong emperors around. And so actually these church leaders come to more prominence in holding things together and, uh, and holding the city together. And so uh, an example of this is when the Vandals come to attack Rome in 455 and they kind of just annihilated and burned uh, everything in their path. It's Pope Leo who goes out because there is no emperor to go out. He had left and got killed by his own people. 
Pope Leo goes out and, and, and are, a, ask for um, clemency or even ask for restraint. And to a degree, uh, the Vandal leader agrees, and the people see the Pope as the true person of the people who is going to fight for them and lead them in these difficult times. Um, so the papacy grows like that. But we also see Gregory the Great. Uh, Brian mentioned Gregory last week, and Gregory is a guy who um, is really a humble, pious guy, and uh, he's, he was one of the guys that uh, Calvin said this was the last good pope, right? Um, Gregory is instrumental in that uh, he's really just one of these guys who's an important leader in a time where there were no other leaders around, and he brought a lot of order to chaos. And uh, what he does during his time is he, he starts to codify Christian belief and practice. And what he does is he looks at the church fathers, uh, he looks at the New Testament, but he also looks at a lot of just the common practices and codifies them. And really the Catholic Church as we know it, with some of their doctrinal emphases, launches from Gregory. Uh, Gregory uh, codifies baptism at birth uh, for original sin with penance during life to take care of accumulating sins. Uh, he codifies praying to the saints. He codifies relics as a uh, worship practice in the church. He codifies purgatory as a reality or a reality um, that they would believe in. And he also codifies this idea of the Eucharist as a fresh sacrifice for sins. I know there's a lot of theological stuff happening there. We don't have time to get into all these theological categories. But it is the Catholic Church and some of the things that would carry forward um, that would develop in lots of ways over these years and that the Reformers would start to uh, come against or write against down the line. Brings us to the 7th century. And uh, the main author I'm using is a guy by the name of Nick Needham wrote a four or five volume, I think a five volume church history uh, work. And he would say the seventh century is the start of the Middle Ages. And he would say it really comes with the rise of Islam because Islam starts to rework the map of world powers uh, in this area of the world, this Mediterranean area. Um, Islam, we're not going to go into Islam uh, <laughs> and, and all of its tenets and its development. But by Muhammad's death in 632, there's a united Arabian army uh, or from the Arab, uh, uh, from Arabia. There's a united army of all those tribes, tens of thousands strong that had never happened before. And it was one of the most effective and fierce armies the world had ever seen to that point. Uh, they were passionate. They were zealous. They were on fire. They were sober because this was a tenet of the Muslim faith. And they really swept the Middle East, North Africa, Asia Minor, uh, even into India like wildfire and brought their faith with them. And what you find is that it's when Islam arises that all of the major cities of the Christian faith who carried power and who weighed in at these church councils uh, come under the reign of Islam, besides Constantinople and Rome. Uh, this is why we, he says this is a big changeover that kind of starts the Middle Ages. Islam would have a lot of uh, good impacts, actually, on uh, the West and on even Christendom. Uh, it's from Islam that we get universities and a lot of development in knowledge in that way. Uh, they had a higher civilization, honestly, uh, in a lot of ways, and we would be impacted by that, um, or the church would, the people would. Uh, they translate Aristotle, uh, and uh, we have access to Aristotle and to a lot of that philosophy through them. And even the Islamic mystics would influence Christian mystics uh, in a lot of interesting ways and uh, speak into how they carry out the faith. There's a good quote here by Nick Needham um, to wrap this up. He says this, At a more popular level, the Muslim-Christian wars and the loss of so much ancient Christian territory, especially the Holy Land to Islam, created a deep emotional fear and hatred of Muslims in Christian lands. Now this was especially the case in the West. Eastern Christians, this is Constantinople, Byzantine Empire, they were in constant contact with Muslims and came to respect their culture and civilization. But most Westerners, who had comparatively little contact with Muslims, developed an almost mindless hostility towards them. The West came to see Islam as the enemy, and this would produce bitter fruit in later centuries through the Crusades. Really important development in the history of the world, and that's what your map on the front of your page hopefully reflects as some of the uh, breakup of these empires uh, and how they sort out. Uh, the rise of the Frankish Empire. I'll be quick here. 
it's in this time that the tribes that would be the Frankish Empire get converted to Christianity. Essentially, a guy named Clovis in the 5th century. His wife is Christian. He's in battle. His gods are letting him down, he feels like. So he calls out to the Christian god, ends up winning a battle, and says, like, hey, that worked. And so he converts to Christianity along with all of his soldiers, and the pope sends someone to come baptize him. Um, this is very, very important because the French um, nation, or eh, it's not really a nation at this time, but uh, these Frankish peoples will develop and be kind of a, a big power in Europe, and they will work hand-in-hand hand with the papacy in a lot of um, interesting ways, and we're going to see this in the next section here, and that's the Holy Roman Empire and sacred kingship. That French nation is what's going to become the Holy Roman Empire. And their partnership with the papacy enables the papacy to finally have an army that is dedicated to them because they're Christians now um, and uh, allows them to actually separate out and become uh, a world power or a worker in the scene of world power in a way that they hadn't uh, fully been able to do before that. The Carolingian family, conversion of the Germanic tribes, and establishment of the papal states. Now, uh, the Carolingian family, uh, we're, we're just going to be quick on this. Uh, they are a family who reign as governors in the French palace. The French palace, the king had kind of become a figurehead. It was actually local land leaders that mostly uh, ruled. Uh, these people actually start to unite uh, these Frankish peoples again and bring them together, but they do so from this kind of second chair role. And so they actually lead everything and have all the power, but they aren't mainly the people who people think are in power. So they're able to accomplish quite a lot in this way. Um, some popular names, Pepin of Loudon, Charles Martel, you've probably heard this name. Um, these are these great military leaders, and here's what they think is important, and this is important for us. It's that uh, they think the best way to bring order to the Germanic tribes in the area is actually to try to convert them to Christianity. Because if they convert them to Christianity, they have more than just a tenuous man-to-man -man covenant or, or uh, agreement amongst them, treaties among them. Uh, they have God over all of it and an authority to God. And they even have uh, these uh, Christian leaders in the papal office uh, that they have a common submission to. Um, also, Christianity actually brought a lot of civilization uh, to a lot of these warring, barbaric, Germanic tribes at the time. And so, um, and so they actually send a bunch of missionaries, and they plant a bunch of monasteries. Most of the missionary work uh, through this church history, uh, this period of church history, happens through monasteries going and planting. And what we need to see here is something really interesting about how conversions worked in the Middle Ages you have to just recognize that a lot of it was just political maneuvering. Uh, people were signing treaties, and part of the treaty was, hey, you need to come and get baptized into the Christian faith and submit to uh, some of these Christian practices. Um, also, some of it was they heard the tenets of the Christian faith, and it quickly became obvious that this is a lot better than our pagan worship system. These are a lot better than our pagan gods, and I actually like Jesus. I actually want to worship Jesus. I actually want to follow Jesus because that is more compelling than the pagan faith that we came from. And that, in that sense, there's, there seems to be an aspect in some people of a genuine uh, following of the Christian faith and even a genuine pursuit of what it is to live as a people of Jesus as opposed to a people of a pagan God. Um, I think we just have to be comfortable with the fact that this was all mixed up and there were some people who genuinely had a change of heart in following the Christian faith and then there's a lot of people who use it as just a political tool uh, and something that they were just doing because uh, that's how, how you, that's just how things worked in this day and age. Uh, you gave up your gods and you, you adopted the gods of someone else uh, in a lot of this war, warring and a lot of this political back and forth. This happens with the French. And uh, what ends up, what's important here to see under this is just that the Germanic tribes actually get converted to Christianity in a lot of ways. Um, and the papal states, that is this big chunk of area, in Italy, uh, eventually gets gifted to the papacy through a number of events. And the papacy in this time now has a big, massive land where they are the sole owners and they have their own economy. And now they actually become uh, a self-sustaining world leader to walk alongside a lot of the other world leaders at the time. 
Uh, this, these, are, these are some big developments that help the papacy continue to gain in power. Charlemagne. Charlemagne is one of the most important people in this period of history, one of the most important people in history in general. Charlemagne uh, founds what is going to be known as the Holy Roman Empire and has an idea of sacred kingship, which will last for a couple hundred years. Well, eh, maybe not a couple hundred years, but about 150 years. Um, and, this, and this idea of sacred kingship meant that it is a secular ruler, a king, who is over both the political scene but also over the church. And now, this is not that dissimilar to what Constantine would have seen. Constantine would have seen himself as lord of both the church or the faith uh, and then also uh, the political power that was the Roman Empire, right? Uh, but this kind of gets revived under Charlemagne, and uh, he's really the one who creates, uh, in the words of Nick Needham, the first great Western empire since the fall of Rome in 410. Um, what do I need to focus on here? I'll just n notice a, a note, a couple things that were uh, important about this period of church history. Uh, first, Charlemagne uh, seemed to be someone who genuinely loved the Lord Jesus. Uh, he genuinely uh, adopted the tenets of the Christian faith. He genuinely wanted the church to thrive and to be a good, righteous institution. Um, he had a lot of these dynamics. He was, he was a zealous person for the Christian faith, as it was understood in that time and as it was kind of uh, expressed in that time. Uh, he also was a guy who was a secular leader and wanted to extend power and to conquer tribes and to expand his territories, right? Um, this is also kind of just what people did in that day and age as secular world leaders. Um, what happens under Constantine is a lot of... Uh, a lot of missionary work, a lot of monastery planting, a lot more of this uh, converting G Germanic tribes into the Christian faith. And it builds a gigantic empire of people who all have a common faith and a common identity uh, that's focused in the Catholic faith. Uh, at, a time, at this time, there's something of a renaissance called the Carolingian Renaissance. Uh, the Renaissance here, um, we're talking about a time of, um, of developmental uh, civil. Civiliz sorry, civilizational development and education focuses uh, that really shapes uh, that really shapes a culture. And so uh, he surrounded himself with a bunch of the best Christian scholars of his day and age. He uh, really emphasized education throughout the empire. So he started developing schools in a lot of the monasteries and in a lot of the churches, educating people in the Christian faith, educating um, priests and educating even just uh, people who would go into secular leadership in the Christian faith. Uh, and in various other things. Um, and this is where this idea of sacred kingship comes up. Charlemagne really saw himself as kind of a good, like a good king of Israel, right? The good kings of Israel uh, were important or were stood before God alone and fleshed out God's rule in the earth, uh, both on the political scene and in the spiritual life. And he kind of said, he kind of thought that this was the type of role he was supposed to play. And, uh, and really he... Uh, starts to make a lot of decisions in the Christian church. Some of the important ones are he is the one who adds what is going to be known as the uh, filioque cause. Filioque, good gosh, I had it down and now I'm, s now I'm stumbling. Filioque clause uh, to the Nicene Creed. Uh, the filioque clause is important. Uh, it's that part in the Nicene Creed where we see the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son. Those three words. Those three words uh, are one of the biggest reasons that the East and West end up splitting, uh, and the Son. Um, really what it does is it sparks a whole different understanding of the East and West, uh, understanding of the Trinity and, and the things that they prioritize and how they thought that that fleshed out both with God in and of himself and also God in relationship with other people. Um, the Western church had followed this clause, right? It, it kind of stated with the Nicene Creed for years, but they hadn't actually put it in officially. Charlemagne is actually the first one to put that in officially, and this becomes one of the widen one of the events that widens the rift between East and West. Um, we can talk maybe more about that in the Q&A, some of the differences in the East and West. I know I kind of skipped over that on the first page, unfortunately. Um, he also standardizes church worship all across the empire. 
Uh, so he writes a book of liturgy um, with homilies that are going to be read. So it's when you go into a church in any place in the empire, it's the same homilies that are read. It's the same worship liturgy uh, and all these things, and this becomes pretty standard. This empire lasts through his son, um, but then really collapses. The 9th and 10th century just sees this Holy Roman Empire that's built in the western part of uh, the, the map there that I gave you. Um, it really just falls into chaos. And this is what they saw as the Dark Ages. And a lot of people there, they really thought that the world was about to end. Uh, waves upon waves of people came to attack and to pillage and to burn. The Vikings uh, are really active at this time. Uh, a very brutal people who just weren't very nice when they conquered a place. Loved a lot of bloodshed, loved a lot of burning, right? Uh, the Muslims were still coming in and fighting. Muslims were actually probably the most civilized of all the people uh, that they fought against. In fact, the Muslims are going to be, um, I think, if you think about just war practices, uh, the Muslims are going to be much better examples of that than the Western church is going to be in the time of the Crusades. Um, uh, usually practice a lot more, um, uh, I don't know. Uh, they let people worship their own faith to a degree. Uh, they don't uh, kill women and children, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the other ones are a group called the Magyars from Asia. Ninth and 10th century are pretty crazy. Uh, and uh, the church is trying to survive. Uh, peoples are trying to survive. There are no really grand leaders who help rule an their big empire anymore. It really collapses into these small little pockets of land that these lords ru rule. And people will give up an oath of loyalty to those lords to say, we want you to protect us uh, from these warring tribes that are coming in to attack us. Um, and that's kind of what the 9th and 10th century does. The Cluniac Revival and monastic orders, um, this is where uh, there starts to be, let me make sure that's right, there starts to be a consolidation or a, a recovery from a lot of these waves of attacks that happened in the 9th and 10th century. And what happens is a lot of these warring tribes are converted to Christianity. Um, those are interesting stories. Every single one of them are really interesting. How they happened, uh, there are... There are these really crazy things that happen where um, people call out to the Christian God and things happen. And that means that they are convinced of the Christian faith and the people underneath them convert. There are times where they are just making uh, these treaties and these relationships with people. Uh, we can't go into all of it, but really in the 9th and 10th century, really the 10th century here, uh, a conversion to Christianity starts to happen with a lot of these people who are coming in and attacking. The most important ones being the Vikings or the Norsemen. Uh, Normandy, Norsemen, uh, that was Viking territory. That was part of the treaties that happened here. Otto the Great. Otto the Great uh, is an important person here. His dates are 936 to 73. This is the 10th century. Um, what he started to do is he started to specifically select Catholic bishops to be the main leaders in this kind of rebuilding of the Holy Roman Empire that he was engaging in, mainly because of this. They were educated, and so he com can communicate them through writing, whereas he couldn't really do that with other people. And also they had no sons because they were supposed to be uh, celibate, right? And that meant that he could select who the next leader was instead of their son coming and thinking that he inherited the ruling office that his father had had. Uh, so... Um, what happens is, under Otto the Great and the people that follow him, the church and its operations and who gets put in places of leadership, who gets uh, in places of put in a priest office or a bishop office or a cardinal office, what have you, is actually decided by secular land landowners who rule the territory that makes the determinations about who gets placed there. It's really important, and it's going to be something that... Uh, some reformers here in the church, not the reformers down the line, but some reformers in this day and age really react against, and, um, and it's going to shift uh, how the Catholic Church relates to some of these world powers. The Cluniac Revival, um, all I want to say about this is Cluny is a monastery uh, that starts in Cluny, France, early 10th century, and it becomes one of the first monastic orders. That is, 
Uh, they make lots of monasteries that are under the same leadership and all follow the exact same uh, kind of operating orders or way of life. And, and they share, um, they, ca they, they communicate with one another and share that. And that's one of the first things that happens in history. They are trying to actually develop uh, good Christian leaders, uh, but what they do is actually end up educating the children of a lot of these kings, and what they're trying to do is they're trying to make good, sacred kings. They're trying to actually replicate this model and put the best of Christian ideals into them while also educating them to be uh, wise and just and effective world leaders uh, through these monastic communities. Um, a lot of great people come from this, uh, and we'll cover... Uh, one of them here in a bit. Uh, they also are the ones who uh, come up with the code of chivalry. Now, the code of chivalry we've all heard about. Uh, chivalry isn't dead. Well, it all happened here, right? At Cluny, um, these warring tribes, what they were, they're warring tribes, and that's how you got um, authority, and that's how you're respected in that tribe. And so what we had were these people who were nobles uh, and the sons of nobles who wanted to go and fight wars constantly, but... They weren't allowed to because they were answering to other people. And so what they did is they tried to say, this code of chivalry is for these people, and we're going to try to take them, use their sword for more virtuous causes. So we're going to say, you can go and fight, but you're going to fight the enemies of people who are bringing injustice. You're going to go protect widows and orphans. Uh, you're going to uh, defend churches. You're going to go and fight even for the poor, right? A lot of good things, uh, but especially... You're going to fight for the causes of the church. The knights are going to be the primary people who lead the crusades and go on crusade when those are called here in a bit. Next category, 11th century. We're flying. I know. It's a thousand years. The cleansing of the papacy and the Hildebrandine reform. As Otto the Great is rebuilding the Holy Roman Empire, the papal office, you notice I didn't really mention it much, right? That's because they kind of just become a pawn of some of the leaders and some of the nobles or the aristocracy, if you will, of the day and age. They kind of, hey, you got more money, I'll try to s make a decision that supports you. Oh, you got some more money, I'll make a decision that supports you. Uh, I'm kind of operating at your whims because you kind of have all the power right now. In 1044, so this is mid-11th century, uh, really, sorry, not mid-11th century, uh, it's... Um, early 11th century, a crisis point is kind of reached. And a situation happens where we get three rival popes that are all trying to say they're the real legitimate pope. Here's how it went down. It's very interesting. Po we have three guys, Benedict, Sylvester, and Gregory. Benedict, Sylvester, Gregory. These are our three characters. Benedict is the reigning pope. He is a grossly immoral man. And so he actually gets deposed through a violent rebellion because he's a terrible guy, right? Um, Sylvester gets placed as a new pope. So Sylvester is now the reigning pope. Well, Benedict's followers decide that they want him back in office and they got the power to make it happen. So they actually come back and they put him back in power. And we have two rival popes. However, Benedict soon decided, I don't actually want to be pope. And so I s he sells his papal office to another guy, Gregory, over here, right? Sells it. He's like, hey, you want this papal office? He's like, yeah, how much are you going to pay me? Here it is. And he had the right price. So now you have Gregory and Sylvester, who are now two rival popes. Both think that they're the right pope, and they have the authority over the church, right? They are the person who is Christ's representative on earth. Uh, and this is a mess, except that Bened or, sorry, yeah, Benedict, uh, after a little bit of time, says, you know what? I think I actually do want to be Pope again. And he comes back. And so we have Benedict, Sylvester, and um, Gregory. Uh, and they all think they're Pope, and it's a big mess. No one knows who to follow. Everyone kind of has their followers. Uh, this is kind of the state of the papacy at this point. One of these Cluny-educated monarchs, Holy Roman Emperor Henry III, is actually the one who comes and cleans all this up. He's a good guy. Uh, righteous life, pious. He's known for being just and wise, he's kind of the Clooney ideal of someone who's going to come in and exercise the authority he needs to in the church to actually drive it toward more righteous and good ends. Uh, he steps in, deposes all three of the popes, 
sets a new guy on the throne, a pretty good pope, a guy who uh, was more worthy of the office than the other three. This is known as the cleansing of the papacy. Um, what happens is this kind of launches an important reform movement in the papacy. People have come to terms and they're like, yikes, like what has the papal office fallen into, right? This is supposed to be uh, the head over the church, uh, and this is supposed to be the person who has authority even um, over the monarchs of the world, we're, supposed to, we're trying to argue. This is supposed to be Peter's direct successor. What has happened, right? Um, like, what, what is going on? And so they start to try to pass some reform, and here's what it looks like. They are trying to address immorality in the papacy. This is sexual immorality, but also actually just marriage, uh, which they, the Catholic Church did not allow for. The Eastern Church did. Um, but the the Catholic Church did not allow for this. Um, so they're trying to address this. They address the practice of simony. That's S-I-M-O-N-Y. Uh, and this is the practice of buying and selling uh, offices of authority in the church, which we just saw. That could be a mess, right? Uh, but this is a pretty common practice uh, at this point. And they're also trying to now address this church-state relationship. They're trying to say, we don't like how much authority and how much say these lay secular leaders have in the church. And I think from our point of view, it could be like, well, yeah, that is an issue. Like, why are there a bunch of outside authorities determining what doctrines happen in the church um, and also what is happening in the church? However, they're not just saying we need to draw out and to kind of do our own thing and make sure that we live a righteous, pious life based on the New Testament. They actually say, no, we should be the ones who actually are over secular leaders, and we should be the ones that make the call, and they actually kind of want to flip the script. Um, this is really where the claims of the papacy, this is really important. This is where they start to become very, very exalted. And it's not just that this person uh, is a successor of Peter. It's not just that they are a person uh, who um, has uh, this weight of authority that's been vested in them, um, all these things. They actually start to say that the Pope is the infallible successor of Peter, uh, even his very incarnation on earth, um, and that he had absolute authority over all bishops and all secular leaders. They're saying the Pope is the person who should be essentially Christ on earth. Um, I am the one who is going to flesh out Christ's kingdom on earth over all rule and authority. Nick Needham says it like this. The papacy, as the Protestant reformers knew it, and as we know it today, came to birth through this Hildebrandine reform movement. Uh, and that's kind of what's happening at this time. Again, that's all during the 11th century. I just want to point to a few people here. Uh, Cardinal Humbert, Peter Damiani, and Hildebrand. Um, Cardinal Humbert is really important because he is one of the most instrumental people in making sure that there is a schism that happens between the S East and the West. Now, the East and the West had argued for many, many years over many, many things. Uh, they didn't share a lot of doctrines. Uh, they had kind of uh, these uh, big sticking points, like what you're doing to the Nicene Creed. The East is saying, hey, listen, this is our most historic uniting creed. You can't just be going and adding things to it because you want to be adding to it. That seems to be a pretty good point. The West is saying, however, it's theologically accurate, and it is a better expression of these theological truths. We would agree with that as well. However, how they went about it in this combative way um, it usually didn't work out. In 1054, uh, 1054, right? Ten f for some reason, I do not have this date on here. 1051, 54? Yeah, 1054. I'm sorry. I just, for some reason, I did not put that date on my uh, thing. 1054. Um, this guy, Humbert, who is uh, either just a determined, zealous, uh, devoted person or one of the most bullheaded, ignorant people or, or uh, arrogant people in history. Uh, that's how both, both the historians I read uh, talked about him. He is sent to uh, talk with the patriarch in Constantinople and to come to terms over some disagreements that have really come to the surface. They started writing against each other and their doctrines and talking to and just kind of amping up the rhetoric. Uh, they're supposed to go and uh, work this out together and find a resolution. Here's how Nick Needham says it. The patriarch and the cardinal were two of the most high-spirited, stubborn, aggressive men who have ever lived in the history of humanity. 
each completely lacking in any of the graces required for diplomacy. Uh, so, what you know, what is it? What, there's like a phrase, you know, you take uh, an immovable immov object and you put it against, uh, what's the other part of it? An unstoppable force. Uh, that That's kind of, for some reason, who ends up at the table to try to negotiate these differences. Uh, needless to say, over the course of a few years, it did not happen. Uh, they just ended up upping it more and more, both entrenched more and more, both said more and more inflammatory things about the other. And then the Pope dies. Cardinal Humbert is just a representative of the Pope. Uh, the Pope dies, and Cardinal Humbert says, great, this is my time. I will act in the name of the Pope. And he walks in single-handedly and puts a uh, document in the church, uh, the main church of Constantinople, and excommunicates the entire Eastern Church and all of its followers. Uh, which means, he says, you're out of the faith, um, and, uh, and you're unsaved. And, of course, they respond by excommunicating him and everybody in the Western faith as well. Um, that East-West schism still is in existence more or less today. In 1940-something, like, uh, the Eastern Patriarch and the Pope came together and, uh, and essentially said, like, okay, we agree. But that difference has really not been made up. Um, that gets locked in in history. This is the one unified Catholic Church that we talk about in the Nicene Creed uh, excommunicating vast swaths of each other and saying you're not in the true faith. Uh, very interesting. Okay, Peter Damiani. Uh, he essentially is so disciplined and focused on reform. He is the one who popularizes self-flagellation or whipping yourself uh, to try to stay pure. Um, and then Hildebrand, uh, his other name will be Pope Gregory V. Uh, a very important person in history. Uh, he is really trying to attack this idea of sacred kingship and try to pull the papacy out from under the control of secular readers leaders and put it uh, over them instead um, and what he does is he kind of gets after the Holy Roman Emperor Henry the fourth and uh, so he writes a long letter and says like you need to stop this practice and of course Henry the fourth actually is like no this is our practice kind of our entire economic model is based off of this uh, and so he kind of writes back and he tells him to kick rocks and uh, he said uh, Hildebrand, no, you step down. It's just, it's a power battle, right? It's two kids on the playground, you know, puffing up their chest more and more. Who has the bigger chest and who's going to take it to the next level? Hildebrand takes it to the next level immediately by excommunicating him and also releasing all of his subjects from their oaths of loyalty to him. And so in about a moment, Henry IV loses his entire army uh, and, and their devotion to him. And now all of his land is up for open grabs for anyone who wants to come and take it from him, right? Uh, good move by Hildebrand. Also, you see that they're starting to wield uh, these uh, spiritual tools for the church, as it were, right? Like this very serious thing. If you need to excommunicate someone for the church, they're just using it in pride against the people that they don't like um, and that they clash heads with. Um, here's how this works out. Very interesting. I'm sorry. I want to tell you these interesting stories in church history. Henry actually comes to repent to Hildebrand, uh, who's actually at Cluny right now. Um, but Hildebrand does not want to accept his repentance because the moment he does, it means all of his people that he released from their oaths of loyalty will then be back under their oaths of loyalty to him. And now Henry will have an army, and, you, and he knows that it's going to come after him. So he's kind of stuck. He's kind of stuck. He's like, e, I am the head of the Christian church. I'm supposed to accept a repentance that someone brings. I also definitely don't want to do this because <laughs> I know that it's going to backfire on me. And so he makes Henry IV stand out in the cold and snow for three days, barefooted, with his wife and children as they were trying to repent. And finally, he accepts their repentance. Um, and, uh, and in due time, Henry raises an army and goes and marches into Rome and runs Hildebrand right out of there. So, uh, Hildebrand dies in exile. Um, what's interesting is this is what leads it to the next point. Uh, Hildebrand's successor that his followers end up choosing. There's two rival popes, by the way, now. Uh, Henry decides, to, I'm cleansing the papacy again. I put up a new pope. Now we have two popes again. Um, the ones who Hildebrand's followers elect and then the one that Henry puts in place. Uh, Urban II is the successor of Hildebrand. Um, and he's actually going to be the one who ends up winning out in this battle because he's going to be the one 
who in a political ploy calls the first crusade and unites all of Europe in a holy cause. Um, I can't go into the crusades a lot, even though they're kind of the most fun, the most interesting uh, in a lot of ways because we have a lot of uh, stories that come from and a lot of the names, Richard the Lionheart, Saladin, right? Um, but well, all we're going to say about the crusades is this. Um, first of all, it was mostly just one long, drawn-out battle uh, with definitive offensive um, events that are happening, right? Uh, so this is something that happens over many, many years. Um, it's a battle for uh, or to retake the Holy Land for, from the, the Turks, the Seljuk Turks, who are now the ones who are leading the Muslim armies. And, uh, and really it's, uh, it is war in the name of Jesus against what they perceive as the enemies of Jesus or the enemies of the church. Um, the important thing I just want to point out about the Crusades uh, this is 12th century that we're into now, if you're keeping track, writing the dates on along the side. Um, this is where indulgences become really popular. We need to know what an indulgence is. An indulgence is something that the Pope says that he can give to people in order to free them from the penalty of their sins that they commit here on earth. Um, so it's not necessarily a forgiveness of sins, but it is the payment for the penalty of their sins that they still have to work out. The Catholic Church held that um, the sins that you commit, though they are forgiven in Christ, there is still a punishment to be um, worked out uh, in this life and then in purgatory until, until you work it all off and then you can kind of go into eternity. Uh, the indulgence is saying this covers that. And the indulgence is given from this pool of goodness uh, which is the treasury of merits. The treasury of merits was this understanding of the saints in history who went above and beyond in all of their holy works. Um, they created this, this treasury of goodness, this treasury of good deeds, and I can pull out of those, uh, the, those merits and I can dispense them to you, and they now cover your sins as if you were the ones who did the good deeds, uh, and then they can clear you from the punishment of your sin. This is what we're promised to the people who would go and fight in the name of Jesus Christ with the cross on their shields to take back the Holy Land from what we're seeing as the great enemies of the Christian faith. Um, very interesting. Uh, soon, uh, by the way, this is how um, the this is how they got soldiers to really commit themselves. Uh, I mean, this is this is a big offering, right? Um, and uh, also, it's how they end up starting to raise money for the church to continue to fund these wars and also to fund other efforts because eventually uh, they start to kind of up uh, how significant these indulgences are, and then they start to just sell them for money to finance uh, the Crusades, and this, this will roll over into financing other things in the church, uh, like St. Peter's Basilica, uh, which stands in Rome today and was the thing that made Martin Luther really start to say these indulgences are out of control. Uh, so you see that we are hurtling forward. Innocent III, I know this is a big section, but it's an important one. Innocent III, uh, this is the height of papal power, really. He launches the last crusade, which is a disaster, incidentally. Um, but uh, as with Gregory the Great, there's just kind of this turn in the political and economic situation of the time that allows him to step in as the main leader who brings order to chaos and who gets people through a difficult time. And he kind of fills this power vacuum. And he really brings almost all of Italy under papal control while expanding the papal states significantly. Uh, we're tracking uh, the papacy swelling and swelling and swelling. And the land that they control and how significant of a world power they are because of this land that they control is an aspect of that. Uh, in his time, he makes the most exalted claims about the pope uh, yet, uh, saying that the pope is over all things in creation, even angels and demons. Um, and is the main authority over them. Uh, and he ends up flexing his power over every major monarch of the time. In Germany, he says, I want the main bishop of Germany to be this. And bishop, the leader of Germany is like, what are you talking about? This has always been my decision. He's like, yeah, well, uh, what if I excommunicate you? And he's like, okay, yeah, sure, you can put your guy there. Um, so humiliates him, does this, uh, something similar in France, uh, with the king there. The king there wants to divorce a wife and marry another one. 
And he's just like, okay, what if I excommunicate you? And he's like, okay, well, I'll continue to be married to the one person that I didn't want to be married to. Just kind of humiliates him. England is the most interesting case because the king in England thinks that he's got some clout to stand up to him. And so what happens is uh, Innocent puts all of England under interdict, which means that the priest at the time could do no church activities besides baptism for infants and last, last rites when people die. And so those uh, two sacraments there. That means there were no church services in England for about four years while the, while the pope and the king battled out to see who had the most power and who would win. Um, eventually, the pope just decides to take it to the next level. He doesn't just excommunicate him, but he actually calls a crusade against England. Uh, which was actually a good deal for all the other European monarchs because here's a whole swath of land that they can just expand their rule into. And so now the, the king of England has to repent, and he actually gives his entire kingdom to uh, the pope. And the pope, I earn, or the pope uh, owned England. I didn't know this. The pope owned England for about 120-something years, and this is actually an issue when John Wycliffe comes around. He's arguing against the fact that he doesn't think the pope should actually really own England. Fascinating, right? I thought it was interesting. Um, okay, Innocent III. Uh, he's the one who really locks in a doctrine of transubstantiation. This has been kind of an active debate uh, in the Catholic Church, come up a few times. He kind of locks this in. Um, and then he also is the one who institutes the Inquisition, where he's trying to track down heretics and new religious movements and eliminate them uh, sometimes by pretty violent means. If you got brought up on Inquisition, it was almost impossible to prove your innocency, even if you were innocent. All right, next category. That was a big one. Two more, th two more bullet points. Scholasticism and the universities. Uh, scholasticism is this um, movement that happens that is really important because of some of the leaders we get and some of the the theology and some of the writings we have that come out of this period. Uh, again, universities. Uh, came from influence from uh, the Muslims. Uh, they had been developing these as uh, early as the 10th century in the East. They have the oldest universities in the world. Um, they were much more advanced in medical, scientific, mathematical, philosophical knowledge. And so uh, finally the West kind of benefits from this and they start to develop universities as these seats of education. What's important about universities, it's kind of the first time now that uh, theological education and even education for clergy can happen outside of the monasteries, which was the main place that it had been happening before. What this allows for is the possibility of a uh, separation between a pious, devoted, holy lifestyle and theological, uh, theological development and growth um, that would try to train you for the clergy. Um, just an interesting development in history there. Um, what do I want to say here? Two methods of education. Uh, the first was just a lecture, kind of like this, uh, but they didn't have access to a lot of books, so they would read a big portion of the book, and then the teacher would give comments on it. Uh, the other one was a popular thing called a disputation, and this is important because a lot of writings will be written in this style that are important to the Christian faith. A disputation is they would take two statements, uh, from uh, authoritative sources, uh, and they seem to contradict one another. And so they would put them both up, and then someone would have to step up and give all the merits and demerits of this statement, all the merits and demerits of this statement, and, and then they would have to say, can these two statements uh, come together and, um, and complement one another, or can they bra be brought into unity, or can they not be? What it did is it made people really good at logical thinking, logical discourse, uh, reasoning, seeing both sides of an argument really well, etc. cetera. Uh, that was a main way of education. Um, I'm going to point out Aristotle. He becomes very available in the 11th century uh, due to the work of two important Muslim scholars, uh, Avicenna, Senna, Avicenna, and Averroes. I mispronounced both those names when I tried. Katie knew them, but uh, Avicenna and Averroes, uh, two important guys. Um, what happens with scholastic theology is essentially the impact of Aristotle. Um, at least a lot of these Christian scholastics are trying to bring 
into agreement the writings of Aristotle, the philosophy of Aristotle, and the tenets of the Christian faith. And this is what a lot of that work is. Um, I'm going to just fly through these. Anselm, um, his big motto was faith seeking understanding from a position of faith. I seek to understand or I seek to engage my reason. Um, the monologian and proslogian um, are uh, him trying to prove the existence of God through pure reason. Uh, something that they did a lot then, uh, trying to see the difference between faith and reason and where they merge and where they don't. Uh, Cur Deus Homo uh, is the first systematic theology of the atonement that's written, which is really important. Uh, Peter of Abelard, uh, Sic et Non is a disputation type book where he takes the tenets of the Christian faith. So he takes authoritative Christian teaching, the church fathers, the Bible, and he starts to say, here are statements uh, that seem to disagree with one another. Can they be brought into unity? Uh, we saw a disputation today in our sermon this morning. Brian read a passage from Hebrews, and he said, this is what this seems to say in context. And some people think this says this, uh, and that it would set off these other passages that we read about uh, the promises that we have uh, uh, for our salvation. And then he said, these are how these two statements stand together in unity. That's kind of like a disputation. It's an example of it, right? Uh, something that we thought offset one another or that contradicted, they actually are unified if you can explain them well. Um, so we see something like that. Peter Lombard, uh, known as the father of systematic theology, his four books of sentences is very similar to Seket Non, Seket Non, but he, uh, he offers solutions to all the difficulties and contradictions, or he tries to, and therefore he starts to create uh, a systematic theological uh, approach to scripture and to church teaching. He's the first one to come up with uh, or to define the seven sacraments of the Catholic Church uh, and also to speak of them not just as signs of grace, but as causes of grace. Uh, that's what that phrase ex opera operato means, um, that these are things that grace is inherent in. Thomas Aquinas. Uh, we live in a place with a lot of the top Aquinas scholars in the world, um, so I'm not going to get into this a lot. Um, I'll, s I'll say the interesting things. Uh, Thomas Aquinas wanted to join um, the Dominican monks uh, at a young age, and he went. His parents didn't want him to join the monks, and so they went and they captured him. And they brought him back to their house, and they imprisoned him. And they didn't want him to go into monastic life, and so they brought a woman in to try to seduce him so that he would get seduced and then therefore not be able to go into the ministry. Uh, pretty fascinating. Uh, it didn't work, uh, and he, he got out of there. Uh, he was known as the dumb ox when he was growing up because he spoke so slowly and people thought he wasn't very smart. He ends up one being one of the most brilliant people and one of the most impactful in the entire history of the world, uh, not to mention the church history. Um, two books. The most important one is a Summa Theologiae. Uh, it says it's his systematic theology. Uh, he never finishes it. Um, his big contributions to Catholic theology, you can see there, um, the big, most important one is he really substantiates transubstantiation and gives a full out explanation of it based on Aristotle theology. I'm not going to be able to get into that. Rumblings of Reformation. This is the last section. Getting into the 14th and 15th centuries here, we start to see that over time there are things that would uh, be Reformation-esque or that would be a similar argument that the reformers would bring up, I'm sorry, or would be something that kind of actually makes the Reformation a little more plausible. And so I'm going to draw attention to a few of those. First, this isn't on your outline, but this is really important. From 1347 to 1400, uh, the Black Death swept across all of Europe and killed uh, a third of the population of all of Europe, about half the population in some locales. If you can imagine that. I mean, if you can imagine when COVID came through, half of the people that you know died like that in the matter of, uh, uh, you know, a couple uh, dozen years. That would remake Europe and change Europe in a dynamic ways. All the ways of how it affects church history are, uh, are not clear, but it's a gigantic event. Um, the collapse of papal credibility and respect. Uh, the Babylonian captivity, this is essentially... Uh, a bunch of French cardinals in the Catholic Church uh, started to kind of want to do their own thing. There are reasons for it, uh, but uh, essentially they got to where they could elect the Pope. The Pope moves from Rome to France, 
and the papal office is now in France for about 70 years. Uh, the, the Catholics know it as the Babylonian captivity. And, uh, and really, it's the Pope just becomes, again, a tool of the French monarchs and the French aristocracy, and they're just caught up in those kind of local politics. And, and the papal office obviously loses a ton of respect and credibility from this. The Great Schism is one of the most important things that happens in the in papal history. Um, 1377, the papacy comes back to Rome under Gregory the 11th, um, and the uh, pope after him uh, is an Italian, and he gets elected. This is great. It's not a French pope. That way, he won't go back to France, right, and continue the charade where uh, the a person who's supposed to be sitting in the seat of Peter is for some reason over in France. Um, so this is important. To make sure this happens, they kind of had a mob that developed to make sure this guy was elected. However, he did get duly elected by all the cardinals in the Catholic Church according to Catholic law. A few months later, 12 of the 16 of these cardinals rescind their decision, say it was illegi illegitimate because of the mob rule, and elect a different man, a different guy, a Frenchman, to that to that role. That guy goes to France and says he's the true pope. Uh, this guy stays in Rome, says he's the true pope. Both have been duly elected by the cardinals of the Catholic Church by a majority. And this exists for about 36 years, a schism in the Catholic Church where there are two active popes, each with different nations, different peoples who follow the different ones. Uh, of course, they excommunicate each other. Um, and so it's a mess. Uh, it doesn't get resolved until 1414. Um, all that to say, the Catholic Church starts to lose a lot of its credibility. People start to say, like, hey, there are some issues with these claims that they're making, uh, and they aren't really living up to them. And then you see uh, a number of reform movements that happen in the Western Church in response to the moral failings. We've seen these in the past. But here we start to see some theological groups that are coming up, or even some theological emphases that I think lead to uh, some of the things that the reformers are going to emphasize and actually say that this is a part of church history. We stand in the tradition of church history. People have been saying this for hundreds of years. It's just now that the movement is finally taking place. Um, we, w we should see that the reformers stood in a reformed tradition. People had tried to reform the Catholic Church because it was a mess. People had tried to uh, reform the papacy because it was a mess at, at different times. Uh, this was a good thing. The reformers wanted to do the same thing. Uh, it's just they end up getting excommunicated, and they have now the strength to start their own movement. It ends up becoming uh, the Protestant faith. Um, 12th century dissenting movements, the Waldensians, they were excommunicated, but they end up developing a lot of these tenets. Uh, most people would call the Waldensians the oldest Protestant body in the world today. It still exists in Italy. Um, 12th century, these guys uh, came, came around, came to a lot of these positions uh, here and, um, and survived. Uh, they were heavily persecuted, but they survived, and they would end up joining up with the Reformers in the 16th century. Petrobrusians, uh, most of them were actually killed, um, and so they kind of dispersed into other groups, uh, but you see their tenets there. Um, the 13th century preaching, preaching monks, uh, these are the friars, the gray friars, the white friars, the black friars. These are these preaching monks, and they're going around, and they're really emphasizing the importance of preaching the word of God as instrumental to the growth of people in the Christian faith. Uh, and they also are emphasizing that people should have a real knowledge of the New Testament. They want to preach and disciple in the common tongue of the people and even one of them comes up with the idea of the grammatical historical interpretation of the Bible, um, which is the interpretive model that we still say is the most uh, viable interpretation model that you should bring to Scripture today. And, uh, and it's one of the main tenets that the Christian reformers would use as well. Uh, qualify that statement a little bit. 14th century Catholic mystics. I'm not going to go into those, but you can see that statement there. Thomas Akempis. Just put a star next to his name, The Imitation of Christ. Wonderful book. It's about walking with Jesus in every aspect of daily life. People still read it today and find a lot of good things that help them in their walk with the Lord. Uh, let's talk about John Wycliffe real quick. I'm just going to go through these books he read or wrote. 
John Wycliffe was in England uh, a little before the Great Schism and then throughout the time of the Great Schism and uh, really started to critique the Catholic Church and the papacy heavily with these books. The Truth of Holy Scripture, he essentially argued for something similar to a scripture uh, or sola scriptura there. Uh, and also the importance of people reading the Bible in their own language, which, of course, would create the uh, understood need that people need Bibles translated into their local language, something the Catholic Church was very uh, resistant to because people started to read the Bible, and there was all these dissenting movements that they didn't like before, the Waldensians, the Petrobrusians, others. Um, on the church, this is in 1378, uh, here he's saying the church is all the elect of God throughout all time. It's not an organization led by the Pope. And he says Christ alone is head of the whole church. If the Pope is head of anything, he's maybe just only head of the local church in Rome. Uh, the power of the Pope, uh, this is where he said the papal office was a human invention, not a divine one. He said if the Pope did not live a humble, holy life, then he's actually an antichrist. You start to see the reformers pick up that language of the Pope as the antichrist later on. On the Eucharist, uh, this is where he comes against transubstantiation as a doctrine. He ends up taking a stance that, as I understood, it was pretty similar to what Calvin would come to uh, down the line in his understanding of the elements at communion. Um, he began the translation of the Latin Vulgate into English, didn't finish it before he died, but his followers would end up finish it. Uh, these people are in England, and this is... Um, what is this, the 14th century, um, so uh, late 14th century, so about 150 years before the Reformation and even longer before the English Reformation takes off. And they are really kind of preparing the grounds um, and, and helping to uh, pave the way for the English Reformation to really take root there. They are translating Bibles, they're translating Bible tracts in the people's language. Uh, the Lollards were his followers. John Huss the only thing we'll say about Huss is this. Um, he is uh, a martyr. Uh, he uh, read Wycliffe, agreed with him. He's a little more moderate than Wycliffe. Uh, in 1411, he specifically launches an attack on indulgences, the practice of indulgences in the Catholic Church. This is about uh, 100 years before Luther does the same thing by nailing paper to a door, right? The 95 theses, theses are about these indulgence practices. Here's John Huss doing it 100 years prior. Um, he ends up getting brought to the Council of Constance under false pretenses. They say they'll protect him. They just want to hear him, you know, defend his view. They arrest him, keep him in jail for six months in terrible conditions, burn him at the stake along with his followers. Um, interesting enough, this launched a civil war in Bohemia, which is modern-day Czech Republic, and the Hussites end up getting some like awesome military leaders who fight against these crusades that are called against them and beat back every crusade that comes against them for 14 years. So the Catholic Church has to, has to negotiate with them, and they get to stay in the Catholic Church. Um, and it was always a tenuous relationship. Obviously, when the Reformation came around, they just joined the Reformers. Woo! <laughs> a thousand years of church history. Good job, Brad. <laughs>